is the sales increase in crop production from the base level of 2005 2007. While the reverse period meat production will have to increase 85. In the past, societies have demonstrated humanity's ability to their ability to invent, substitute, or even to implications for humanity. Now for the food system, this means ensuring access to nutrition, nutritious food, as well as access to natural resources and resources that are essential for producing food. While dominant discussions on global food security have captured many of these issues. One vital challenge has been largely uh, committed to date, and this is future phosphorus scarcity. Phosphorus is one of the world's most critical and strategic resources. Without phosphorus, we could not produce food. In its natural form, phosphorus only exists as phosphate rock at the surface of the crust. And on elements such as carbon and nitrogen, it is a non renewable with finite reserves. No other element can perform the same role as phosphorus. And since humanity has grown to be dependent on fossils to improve food security, is shortage of economic, social, and environmental implications. Now, this lecture will highlight the essential role of phosphorus for modern agriculture, as well as the exhaustible nature of phosphorus as a resource. It defines peak phosphorus and what it means for short-term and long-term food production and food security in this country. The lecture will also examine strategies to cope with the impact of peak phosphorus on agricultural productivity and food security of the country. So, Madam Chairperson, I want to move on and give you a gist of key features of a very critical strategic element which is called phosphorus. The critical life giving properties of the element phosphorus are reasonably well understood today. According to some scientists, there is relatively little disagreement about scientists, industry, as well as, as to the key features of phosphorus. Phosphorus is among the most common elements found in the earth's crust and was good, good life's bottleneck. By a science writer uh, called Isaac. As in 1974. He wrote, quote, life can multiply until all the phosphorus is gone. And then there is an inexorable thought which nothing can prevent. He wrote, we may be able to substitute nuclear power for coal and plastics for wood and yeast for meat and friendliness for isolation. But for phosphorus, there is neither substitute nor replacement. Phosphorus is essential to life and serves multiple roles that sustain 
are with other critical global resources, such as oil, can be replaced with renewable energy sources, such as wind or solar power. No other, I repeat, no other element can replace phosphorus in food production. In agriculture, and I'm chairperson, Phosphorus is often applied at the farmer's do in the form of processed phosphate salt tanks that dissolve into salt or water and increase plant pea uptake. It is an essential ingredient in the manufacture of agricultural fertilizers, along, as I've said, with nitrogen and potassium. While nitrogen can be obtained biologically from the air and supplies are far larger. It will be phosphorus that will be a real challenge for future productivity in our agricultural systems. Its continuous supply constitutes the foundation of modern agriculture. Phosphorus deficiency is often the limiting factor of land growth as shown uh, there, that phosphorus is a critical element in food growth. Um, I wanted to show you some more, but we shall continue. That phosphorus is a critical element in food security. A shortage of phosphorus in any um, agro-system results in low agricultural productivity that in many cases may cause undernourishment and in extreme cases, famine. All modern agricultural systems are dependent on continual inputs of phosphate fertilizers derived from phosphate rock. In fact, about 82% of the extracted phosphate rock goes into fertilizer. Of the extracted phosphate rock goes into fertilizer production. Seven percent goes for animal fees, one to two percent for food additives, and the remaining eight to nine percent of the fee is needed in a wide range of industrial applications such as detergents, matches, fireworks, food and beverages. We obtain phosphorus by consuming of course plant and animal products whereas plants obtain phosphorus from the soil. Although all three micronutrients are naturally available in arable soils to a certain extent, their quantity is often insufficient for high crop yields. Or they only occur in forms that are not readily usable for plants, a circumstance which is especially relevant in the case of phosphorus as it is chemically very reactive element. Alongside other nutrient inputs such as nitrogen and potassium, application of these uh, pea fertilizer salts has dramatically raised agricultural productivity in developed countries during the 20th century. Conventional mine pea fertilizers are manufactured from reserves of phosphate rock, as I've already indicated. Now, despite not being a rare or a scarce element in a geochemical sense of the word, phosphorus has been said to be one of the most crucial inputs for modern agriculture, a, a main driver behind last century's revolution. Some scientists have emphasized that with 
without the advent of phosphate fertilizer application to agricultural soils during the second half of the 19th century, the deterioration of soil fertility would have made human life in the industrial countries unsustainable. Today, it is common consensus that phosphorus additions guarantee high yield and high intensity agriculture and are therefore needed to ensure global food supply and food security. Now, during the next debate, it is expected that there will be an additional demand for phosphorus due to an increased demand for wheat and other dietary changes, particularly as emerging nations become more developed. Now, that phosphorus is not only one of the key elements allowing rapid historical and still ongoing population growth, but it is also at least partly responsible for increased agricultural productivity. From, we go back to history, historical perspective, the artificial addition of phosphorus to arable land in the form of mineral phosphate fertilizer is relatively new development, becoming widespread only after the Second World War. But even before that, farmers were well aware of the beneficial effects of phosphorus containing materials on plant growth, which made substances such as guano. Guano is a, a biogenic material uh, from bird and bat droppings deposited over thousands of years. Guano, uh, this material used to be found in uh, some countries close to Peru in uh, South America. Now, apart from this guano, Bone meal, and if you go through the Bible, uh, best um, orchards were established in areas where there had been a lot of war. And my reverend minister, for ministers are here, and they will be able to tell you this. Uh, I have all the references, but I present it uh, for now. Now, animal manure phosphate were discovered as concentrated sources of phosphorus and applied extensively to food crops. The Chinese, Madame Chairperson, used human excreta, coat nine soil, as a fertilizer from the very early stages of their civilization. In Europe, during the mid to late 19th century, the use of local organic matter was replaced by phosphorus material from distant sources, which were then seen as unlimited. Simultaneously, the introduction of flash toilets in towns meant that human waste was charged into water bodies instead of being returned to the soil. But not everyone was happy with this turn of events. Among the protesters against this was a gentleman called Victor Hugo, who wrote in Les Miserables in 1968, quote, Science, having long grouped about, now knows that the most fecundating and most efficacious of fertilizers is human manure. Thanks to human gut, the earth in China is still as young as the days of Father Abraham. <laughs> Chinese wheat yields a hundredfold of a seed. There's no guano comparable in fertility with the dirty trust of a capital. A great city is the mightiest of dunk makers. Certain success who attend the experiment of employing the city to manure the plate 
If our gold is manure, our manure, on the other hand, is gold of gold. The need for continuous phosphorus in food in agriculture can be attributed to two, two different rationals. On the one hand, phosphorus is removed with each harvest at a higher rate than the soil can naturally provide. Therefore, phosphorus needs to be supplied artificially in order to keep crop yields constant and the soil's phosphorus stop from getting depleted. On the other hand, Madam Chairperson, there's a strong economic incentive for farmers to apply large quantities of phosphate fertilizers to the soil for it usually is fast acting and leads to higher crop yields. However, there are limits to this rationale. For instance, phosphate fertilizer application is subject to diminishing marginal returns and my former by chancellor is here. And I believe uh, you will have to believe that it's wrong. <laughs> it's subject to diminishing marginal returns in terms of crop yield. And above a certain threshold, additional phosphorus input to soil nearly results in increased runoff and leach. Among the primary nutrients, phosphorus deficiency in Ghanaian soils stands out as a major constraint to food production in no input systems such as those practiced by the majority of our farmers. Ghana consumes less, less than 10 kilogram uh, P per head. This is considered to be the least among our neighboring countries, such as Cote d'Ivoire, Togo, Benin, Burkina, and Nigeria in the West Africa subregion. Large areas of farmlands are chronically deficient in pea. This is uh, supposed to be uh, the dominant source in Uganda. And I will, just because I'm a soil scientist, I can't help but to introduce you to some of these steps. Uh, we are starting from that corner, Ghana map on your right. And we call it uh, sandy parasols. Yeah. So, sandy parasols. Then, based upon this classification, there is this chunk here, which is called active anisole. Then, we just up there, there, on the Arctic Arizona, we have the Arctic Disisodes. What are all these things? Now, they, they are extremely important. You don't have time to try and uh, uh, explain what these things stand for. But the point I'm trying to make is that if you move it from this area where from uh, is from, where you have dominant parasol, uh, all the way to the concretional source in the north, the single source, and these soils are extremely low in phosphorus. Sometimes I hear people say, oh, as of Ghana, we can put a maze here, and tomorrow it will grow. Yes, it will grow, so what? The growing is not the issue, but the quality and the guilt which you want to get out of it. So this is the problem. Of course, these are just the general. If you go down, you will see different soils called, unfortunately, there's no trouble from where it is called Ajima Common Series. <laughs> but we do have Ajima Series and so on and so forth. And I guess at the appropriate time, We'll talk more about that. My 
and I'm chairperson, unless phosphorus fertilizers are used in these soils, even the best recycling system will not achieve the minimum soil P levels required for good years. So far, I have been trying to introduce you to this all called rock phosphate. And I said phosphorus is from rock phosphate. And you need the phosphorus if you want food to eat, etc. etc. Now I just want to talk briefly about this one. Because the core of the peak phosphorus is based upon this. And I will tell you where we have some deposits of phosphate rock in this country. I will not tell you why we are not uh, exploring it. Maybe it is for very good reason, strategic uh, reason. Ladies and gentlemen, phosphorus rock, the main source of phosphorus, is found in two forms of deposits. Sometimes I tell my students three instead of two. But let me go according to uh, our research. Sedimentary and igneous. The majority, about 83%, is sedimentary. And uh, the main producers of sedimentary phosphorus, uh, phosphorus, we tend to have a higher grade. Some of the rocks are of higher grade and others are of lower grade. So I'm referring to those sources which are of higher grade. Now countries which tend to have this higher grade rock fossil are China, the United States, Morocco, and Tunisia. Igneous fossils are mainly found in Russia, South Africa, Zimbabwe, Brazil, Finland, and there are also some uh, interviews of low grade uh, phosphorus rock in Finland. Now, the primary method of mining sedimentary phosphate rock is surface or slip mining and consists of, just like I'm saying, really, consists of clearing the vegetation, removing topsoil, and overlying rock before removing the ore. Except for a handful of underground mines, most of the world's phosphate rock is extracted uh, from large open pits in various regions of the world. And I want to show you a typical large open pit gas mining of phosphate rock in the public of Togo. Now this is sedimentary rock these are the raw So uh, they clear and then they mine, they dig. And if you travel by road from Lome to Kotomi, now if you look on your right, you will see that the sea is completely colored. Why? Because we are washing uh, this material. They are with water and they are letting it run into the sea. So you see a large set of land. If you haven't seen this, next time you travel on the road from uh, Lome to Koto, just watch out and you will see this massive pollution. It is, it is fantastic. You will see it and you ask yourself, what is, what is, what is happening? Uh, fortunately for them, we don't have small scale uh, rock phosphate mining. We don't. Because if you mine the rock, what are you going to do with it? You really need to polish it before you can send it to the industry. So they don't have it. But the massive effect of this uh, on the environment is, uh, it is incredible. Now, phosphorus is the 11th most abundant element in the earth crust. Yet, practically useful deposits are geographically concentrated 
in only very few countries. Yeah, this is the map of the world. And it shows where the country, where rock countries are mined. Now, see the distribution of the rock countries. Now, I want you to take note of this area. This is where we have Morocco and Western Sahara. And I'm going to tell you an interesting thing about that is deposit here. Now, in 2011, China by far was the most largest producer of phosphate from 81 megaton, followed by the US 28.1 megaton, Morocco 28 uh, megaton, and Russia 11.2 megaton. Together, these four countries were responsible for nearly 75 of global phosphate uh, rock production. Now, according to some uh, researchers, global phosphate rock production amounted to 198 megaton in 2011. And of the 198 megaton of phosphate rock mined in 2011, only about 31 megaton, or approximately 16%, were exported. Therefore, 78% were exported from North African countries and countries of the Middle East, such as Jordan, Syria, and Egypt, can you imagine? With Morocco 36.7, clearly holding the title of being the world's largest exporter of phosphate rock. Now, sure, in Africa, we also have something. Africa's phosphate rock uh, resources are vast, I must admit. Approximately 42% of the world's total phosphate reserves are derived from Africa. The distribution of major phosphate rock deposits in Africa is shown. Uh, you can't because it's not that. So you see, all these spots are phosphate rock deposits. What's the name? This is Ghana. And we have a deposit here. And we have another deposit here. And I'll tell you a lot more about it. Because what we have here is the extension of the word Togo. And I've already indicated that in the Republic of Togo, they mine phosphate rock. So I'll tell you that. And I'll also tell you that this man is also mixed up with the one in uh, Nigeria, and so on and so forth. The interesting thing that I have observed is that most of the deposits in West Africa are sedimentary, whereas most of the deposits in uh, East Africa are igneous, and there's a reason for that. Now, other large resources of phosphate rock in uh, Africa, aside from Morocco, and Western Sahara, Tunisia, and Egypt, and uh, South Africa, Senegal, South Africa, Senegal, and another country which is uh, Togo. Uh, Togo has come in for uh, recognition. Fossil rock is non renewable uh, resource. That takes 10 to 15 million years to form. And production from high grade reserves is likely to peak in the coming decades. Peak phosphate, despite increasing global demand. Now, at this stage, I just want to continue by looking at phosphate. Uh, rock and its impending scarcity. And I'm looking at peak phosphorus. What do I mean by peak phosphorus? And I want to slowly go through it. At the end of the lecture, 
I'm expecting that at least 80% of my audience will go home knowing what is meant by a PD process. This was one, 100%. Now, the word PD in the last decade was mostly associated with oil. I'm sure those of our senior colleagues who are in the oil industry will know this. However, in the last few years, the expression has been linked to other resources, such as fossils. While many people are now familiar with the reality of peak oil, peak oil, everybody's talking about it, peak oil, there is much less awareness that peak phosphorus is also a fine and non-renewable uh, resource, and that supply is also expected to peak in the future. Now, according to um, a lady scientist who has worked in this area for quite a number of times, she says that the term peak phosphorus denotes a point in time at which the production of high quality and relatively inexpensive phosphate drop reaches its maximum due to the decreasing availability of phosphate drop deposits declining steadily thereafter, and even though demand exceeds supply. Now, the lady suggests a peak in peak production of 29 uh, megaton peak per year in 2033. Now, according to the analysis, the rate of production will be reduced to 10 megatons uh, peak per year in 2100. Another uh, scientist is also focused that a large increase in key fertilizer use of cropland in developing countries and estimate that 36 to 64 percent of pea reserves will be utilized by 2100. Now, this is a very common graph used by scientists in the oil industry. Uh, Hubert 1954 developed a model for estimating how long uh, American oil will last. And they developed this very graph model. And they have a way of calculating it. And they realized that if you use this model, uh, two very important uh, indices can be obtained. First, you can get a year of maximum uh, production, that's the peak. And at the same time, you can get a retrievable uh, resources. And so this area, you can retrieve it, but at a point in time, right? Now, this model has been used by scientists in reference to phosphorus. Because why? Phosphorus is just like oil. It is finite. It is not renewable. And therefore, if you have yeah. used uh, this model to determine when oil can keep, you can also use the same model uh, to determine when a particular resource will also be. Uh, after using this model, he then plotted the black line. And you observe that it tallies with or it correlates with Uber's uh, peak. And they realized, one of them realized, that, that if you do this, then it should be possible to estimate when 50% of any phosphate deposit so, on the basis of this, some scientists are saying that by the year 2033, the phosphate drop will be. And when it peaks, what happens? Because we would have removed all the easily 
is taxable economically uh, material. Yeah. No problem. Very cheap. So people even don't take care of their pet life. But after this stage, that is where you have a problem. And that is the peak. So this curve is showing actual and projected peak production. Now, according to a gentleman called White and Connor, it is not when a resource is completely gone that problems arise, but when the high quality, highly accessible reserves have been depleted. Now, this is the point at which production reaches its maximum, its peak. In other words, the quality of the remaining reserves is lower. They are harder to assess and thus increasingly uneconomical to find. Supply then declines and price rapidly increases. Now, recent analysis using the peak oil analogy, who bet, as I've said, towards a, a biochemist with Shell Company, uh, using the same peak theory, have also predicted that. At current production rates, the world's phosphate production will reach its peak before 2040 and enter a long, slow decline. This is right. At least to me. Some people say that, oh, I'm talking about, or I'm joining the doomsday sales. And they are always saying that the world is going to come to an end, and so on and so forth. But we can argue on this direction. Why I think that we do have a problem when we get to this peak. The Lubeck curve is a modeling method, and I believe that uh, Prof. Adam and some of us are introducing it in uh, oil, oil industry. Originally proposed to analyze US oil production. It assumes that the rate of production is proportional to the product to the amount of the resources that have been consumed uh, times the amount remaining. The model that predicts the shape of the production versus stand curve will be bell shaped with two parameters the peak year of production and the amount of ultimately recoverable. Resource. Again, this is a term which is very common uh, in the oil industry, the new RR. Hubert uh, successfully predicted the peak of the national US uh, production. Uh, when I was in London a few months ago, we had a long debate on the new RR uh, using this week. While some of us supported it strongly, as I've said, some people. Uh, against it. And so we had the four and then the against. Uh, I was four, and there were quite a number of scientists who were against that by 2040 uh, we will get to the peak, global peak, not Ghana peak, global peak of phosphate drop. And I believe that this is really alarming. Like oil, in the 1970s, fossil uh, rock is experiencing its first significant price shock, a 700% increase from US dollars 50 per ton to now 350 US ton. Again, the economists were saying, ah, allow the market, the market to handle it. So don't, don't worry about that. Yes, if farmers know that they can get uh, fertilizer, there's always a way to go around it. Again, this is problematic. Now, this again is the graph uh, from World Bank data, uh, 2006 to 2011, on phosphate drop commodity uh, price. There's a reason why in 2008 there is a peak. And we'll look at 
And I'm telling So this is where we are. What at all is the impact of the big force force on agriculture and food security? I guess that by now most of you have already formed an impression that well, if force force work is expensive, then we can use other things. But let's scientifically look at this issue closely. Limitations of uh, cereal production and animal feed will begin when the cost of pea fertilizer uh, increases. That is, when the supply is less than demand or the demand is more than the supply. The economic challenges of expensive trade uh, may disproportionately affect food production in Ghana, but have no preliminary results of commercial scale or very limited uh, results like Ghana. Unlike developed countries where oil or where only a small fraction of grossly store food, cost about 20%, are actual factors, that is the cost, including fertilizer, incurred by farmers to produce the food. In Ghana, the situation is different. Here, the people eat mainly uh, local and unprocessed foods, where a much larger fraction of food uh, costs reflects farm costs. Thus, the market signals of phosphate growth scarcity will be felt strongly in the country by both the small scale farmers and the commercial farmers. Now, these economic challenges may translate into food shortages, perhaps even localized or regionalized farm, and the political instability that often accompanies such adversity. Remember, the global food crisis of 2008 led to violent um, food droughts in 40 countries, including major unrest in Bangladesh, Haiti, India, and Mexico, among others. Now, similar phenomena occurred in mid 2010, when increases in food crisis caused deadly droughts in Mozambique, Egypt, Senegal, and some other African countries. Now, these price spikes are not driven by food scarcity per se, but the results demonstrate the volatility of human response to real or perceived stress to food assets. Ghana and other developing countries have emerging middle classes that will demand more meat, causing fertilizer demand to grow even more as livestock are less phosphorus efficient than tax. Now, this phenomena of population growth and overuse coinciding with peak uh, phosphorus production will drive prices drastically higher and force a number of changes in the Ghana's food production and consumption. The potential for catastrophic food shortages and global farming moves without significant systemic changes. A high proportion of Ghana farmers are also resourceful in terms of capital, land, labor, and livestock. And this together with high cost and low accessibility will prevent many farmers from acquiring fertilizers for their farming practices. In 2007 to 2008, the Ministry of Food and Agriculture introduced fertilizer subsidy to cushion farmers and Ghanaian farmers against five to seven folds that uh, increase in the price of pea fertilizer and the demand for fertilizer and other agricultural resources. Plus, the government policy helped to avert any crisis as experienced in some other African uh, countries. It is predicted, Madam Chairperson, that the future peace scarcity will be a huge disaster to Ghana's agriculture 
and food security and bed. <laughs> <laughs> so, what are the options? Now, the first have been laid bare. At a particular point in time, we are going to run into people's first production. We will not have enough material to process for process. And we are saying that that will affect our agriculture. How? Because prices will go up. And unless government decides to come in, there is going to be a big problem. Are there options? Surely there are. There are quite a number. Some of these options are easy you know, to handle. Others may not, but I'll try and give a few, uh, which I think we can take away. Historically, Madam Chairperson, concerns have been made in Britain regarding the potential scarcity of fossils. U.S. President Roosevelt addressed fundamental aspects of sustainable phosphorus management in his message to Congress on phosphorus for soil fertility uh, on May 20th, 1938. And I want to quote you. I cannot, this is President of <laughs> I cannot overemphasize the importance of phosphorus, not only to agriculture, and soil conservation, but also in the physical health and economic security of the people of the nation. Many of our soil types are deficient in fossil, their tool, thus causing low yields and poor quality of crops and pastures. Recent estimates indicate that the removal of phosphorus from the soils of the United States by harvested crops, grazing, erosion, and leaching greatly exceeds the addition of phosphorus to the soil through the means of fertilizer, animal manure, and bedding. It appears that even with a complete control of erosion, which obviously is impossible, a high level appears that even with a complete control of erosion, a high level of productivity will not be maintained unless phosphorus is returned to the soil at a greater rate than is being done at present. And he poses a question. Therefore, the question of continuous and adequate supplies of phosphate crop directly concerns the national wealth. It is therefore high time for the nation to adopt a national policy for the production and conservation of phosphate for the benefit of this and coming generations, unquote, President Roosevelt, 1938. Ladies and gentlemen, we can see from this passage how the basic principles of phosphorus management have already been identified by the 1930s. However, these concerns were largely ignored as phosphate work was seen then as cheap and limitless, a limitless source of power. Today, the world's food system are dependent on inputs from mine phosphate work, which is on the decline to maintain high agricultural productivity. Let's look at what we do, basic things in agriculture. In crop production systems in both high and low potential areas, the efficiency of phosphor fertilizer use should be improved through better timing and placement of phosphorus. We all know that. Now, but plant breeding that improves the yield of crops per unit of feed after is more sustainable approach than just selected plant varieties that scavenge in the soil and hasten the decline of soil being reserved. The use of modern tools such as precision agriculture.
to enhance spatial efficiency of total application, or decision support systems that help set application rates or provide a systemic basis for addressing the agronomic effectiveness of fuel should be advocated. Now, biological innovations to improve phosphorus uptake, such as inoculation with a fungus, which is called vesicular abuscular mycorrhizae. <laughs> or the use of key accumulating plants, such as Jonah species, for clean manually, they uh, offer new solutions to this intractable uh, problem. Fortunately, I've done a lot of work, and my whole PhD was on this fungus called vesicular abuscular mycorrhizae. <laughs> we can spend the whole night talking about DPD uh, mycorrhizae and phosphorus nutrition. There's another possibility that we can do, and I call it closing the human food cycle. A list of solutions uh, so far, from exhaustive uh, and unexhaustive, is meant to entice biologists and non biologists alike into the nursing convention conversation about the sustainability challenges of the human food cycle. One option that does not involve closing the human food cycle is locating new sources of mineral fuel. Many economists and technologists argue that markets respond to scarcity and higher prices by creativity and creatively finding new sources of or viable substitute for a product. And that this creativity is driven by commodity Price. Well, I'm sure you agree with me. <laughs> Although we cannot envision a viable substitute for elemental phosphorus, the former scenario is likely with mineral fuel, particularly when it becomes more scarce and expensive. There's considerable agreement that though no large scale phosphate development forces have been found in Ghana, several indications point to the existence of this problem. In the country. Uh, this is part of my land. Now, where you see this land, it means that you will have some deposits of phosphate blocks. All right? Now, so far, uh, Mr. Kessie, who was the director of Ghana Geological Survey, and he has had and uh, Mr. Ikusu, who was a lecturer at the Geology Department, University of Ghana, they have done a lot of work on this deposit. And that is the Qatar uh, Basin. Yeah. The interesting thing is that the Qatar Basin is on the Portanian formation. Now, where you have a lot of uh, sandy soils. And this is where, you know, we, some years ago, we were looking for oil because of the formation, the Portuguese formation. Now, in addition to that, let's see in the UC, they have lost this. And so far, from what we know, this uh, rock or the wall of it extends to the public of Togo as have already been created. So at least in Ghana, we are something. So if all the chips are down, we can go to the database and see what we, we can get from there. But this is an open. How about human being cycle in agricultural production? I think that not many people will be confused about what I'm going to say. But please allow me to say it with the deepest uh, respect. There are numerous opportunities to grow the human food cycle at the agricultural and food production stage. Some solutions are relatively simple, whereas others will require wholesale transformations um, in the way we grow 
fertilize, process, and transport food. Now, relatively easy solution include a apply fertilizer in amounts that better align with growth and stereometric needs. B bioengineering cross strains that requires less speed for the same crop production or that more uh, efficiently take up the from the soil. C better control of erosion losses of key resource from farm fields and D returning non-consumable uh, crop resin to soils or feeding it to livestock. However, the industrialization of agriculture has created challenges to closely the human insight that may require more transformative thought. For example, reducing meat consumption will reduce the amount of feed flowing through the human insight. Can we do that? But that's a fact. Nonetheless, if we assume that meat will remain a substantial complement of the human diet, the best opportunity for on farm feed recycling is to produce crops and livestock in the same basis and reduce waste instead of running after the those food. Uh, I think that we need to think outside the box and see what we can do internally. At least this one we are talking about fertility. So integrate the waste from the animals and also from crops for the benefit of humanity. Now, not only this is not necessary to pass up this animal production because waste is already recycled. The transformation challenge is that's about though is that crop and animal production are not co-located in many places, particularly in Yang. Considerable geographic, institutional, and infrastructure inertia will need to be overcome to bring this together. Agriculture advances are helping to close this component of human feed cycle. For example, researchers at the University of Guadalajara have developed transgenic Yosha peak that excludes 30% to 65% less speed than its precursor. Pigs are unable to digest uh, phytic, a compound that makes up 50% to 70% of their diet. I'm not going to go into this because I'm not here for uh, these transgenic things. I'm just looking at pig fossils, a pig fossils alone. But we can close the human pig cycle at human waste treatment. The other major component of human feed transformations is seaway production and treatment. Where treatment wetlands, where treatment wetlands or other ecosystems are being used for tertiary seaway treatment. The plant material and salt from these ecosystems may be periodically harvested and used directly uh, in crop production. The prevalence of concern with our phosphorus can be again illustrated by another gentleman who used the absence of phosphorus recycling as example of technological advancements in the very serious, in the very serious uh, 1928 novel called Point Counterpoint. He said, quote, with your intensive agriculture, he went on. You are simply draining the soil of phosphorus more than half of 1% a year, going clean of separation. And then the way you throw away hundreds of thousands of tons of phosphorus spent outside in your sewage, pouring it into the sea. And you call that progress. Madam Chairman. Urine is pea rich and essentially sterile. The WHO suggests that recycling urine could provide half 
the key necessary to grow Syria. And this is food in 2006. Now, currently, two Swedish cities now require the use of urine diabetic. Now, this one, urine diabetic dies at uh, college from India. And then, a urine diabetic dies from, uh, from Sweden. Now, so we separate the liquid from the solid. And this is a Sweden. Let me also add that, as I've said, two Swedish uh, cities now require the use of urine diabetic toilets that separate urine from solids and recover the liquid waste. And the Swedish national government, I repeat, the Swedish national government has set a goal of recovering and reusing 60% of all beef in sewage by the year. 2015. With the proper infrastructure, beef may be efficiently recovered through the direct use of urine or precipitating when you process urine. You get a compound, and the compound is called subite. You get crystals of subite, and it's basically ammonium magnesium phosphate that can be applied directly to plant growth. So you use the urine, if you process it, you get your pet life. And that is wonderful. Another major barrier and value to closing the human waste portion of the free cycle, maybe merely psychological, Mr. President, with due respect. In much of the world, human excreta are perceived not as a reason at all, but as something to remove. That is to be trashed. Modern societies invest considerable resources and show the rapid removal of treatment, a discharge of human waste, and people rarely, if ever, come in contact with their own waste. There are clearly public health challenges, I must admit here, but they are not insurmountable. Fundamentally, Overcoming this psychological stigma to a point at which people recognize that their own waste can be a resource, won't be necessary and is far from trivial. Uh, trivial. Having said all this, let me try and conclude from what I've seen. The doubling of human population over the last 50 to 75, 75 years, and likely because of the greater have required a concurrent increase in the use of inorganic tissue. Fossil cycles over the logic. Time scales, making it effectively a non renewable uh, resource. A review of estimates of peak recycling in the human fossil cycle show considerable variability and uncertainty. But today, it appears that only about one quarter of the fertilizer that we use in agriculture is recycled. Whereas some of these phosphorus inputs are returned to arable land in the form of manure and crop residue, the majority is not. Instead, various inefficiencies along the value added chain in fertilizer and food production, as well as natural soil degradation, entail considerable phosphorus uh, losses to the environment. Eventually, a significant amount of phosphorus ends up in the ocean. Once it has dissolved there, phosphorus is today, as well as in the foreseeable future, not recoverable. 
and thus giving us eminently for human use. I've already indicated that when you pour all this into the sea, it takes more than 100 million years to have a sedimentary rock full of what you uh, form. Now, the fossil cycle is a cycle only the very long run, and unfortunately, not a human can see. Ultimately, it is this combination of modern agriculture, strong dependence on fossils, is currently highly unsustainable use and uh, uh, unreviewable and finiteness of fossil raw resources that recently attracted increased scientific and public attention. Thank you very much for your time.
I fall and I'll help me to get to where I am. First, I need to thank my maker for making all things possible for me to stand before this August assembly on this day to make this presentation. But for his kind mercies, I don't think that I may have been there. I'm grateful to my late parents, Bafo Ejibemwa and Madam Mina Lucia, aka Efia Edia, who through their hard work and sacrifices have made me what I am today. I'm sure that if they were to be alive, they would have been here to celebrate this momentous occasion with me. I'm grateful to the extended family members at Achimekropon for their diverse support in my education. I'm also grateful to all my past elementary and middle school teachers at Achimekropon who identified something in me. And so for many years, of many years ago, and helped to nurture me to see the light. I'm also grateful to all my university professors who supervised and mentored me at different stages of my academic career. They are numerous uh, to be mentioned, but please permit me to mention the names of just a few. One, the late Professor D.K. Akwe, who supervised both my ESC and MSc degree dissertations at the South Science Department West of Ghana and who showed keen interest in my academic pursuit. The late Professor Alan Wai of Frederick University. who also supervised my PhD research work. The late Professor David uh, Shepter Reed of Sheffield University and Professor Paul Black of University of Bonn, who mentored me after my PhD research work in Reading. To my uncle, Professor Ellen Gordy, who has been my source of inspiration and encouragement life, from the early days of my life at Achille Kropon up to now. I'm grateful to you, Uncle, and may God bless you. I'm also grateful to my dear friends and colleagues, the late Professor S. A. Danso and J.C. Norman, who shared their academic experiences with me and supported my candidate for membership of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences. To Dr. Elias Ayu, the director of UN Accra, I wish to say merci beaucoup. <laughs> I'm thankful to all my postgraduate students, especially Amos Wekure, who team up with me and helped to publish a number of excellent scientific papers in the area of fossils in refugee journals. Finally, finally, what do I say? I'm very grateful to my wife, Elizabeth. <laughs> and all children, uh, Joyce, Nanaya, and Pia, for all their support, understanding, love, tolerance, sacrifices, and prayers as I went through my academic career. The massive support of my in laws, George Tumasieri, Caroline Rose Bergman, and Dr. Ambassador Ansan are highly acknowledged. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, let us also make our decision for our table. The next inaugural lecture will take place in this auditorium. It will be delivered by Professor Josia Gomampe. That will be on the 20th of October. Slavery in Ghana, our story, our heritage. You are all invited uh, to become a testament to the Protestant Commission that we have joined to everything that is great. There will also be some light refreshments after the function. The fellows who have their refreshment is for here. The rest of the day. Audience will have refreshments 
this in front of each other. So, thank you for coming. Have a pleasant day.